Good morning. Welcome to River's Edge Community Church. Thanks so much for being here, part of our worship service where we can gather together as friends and one in the bond of love. Today is part three in our four-part series on gratitude, which we have entitled An Overflow of Gratitude. Last week, we talked about how gratitude is a superpower and how it produces all sorts of good things in both the emotional and on the spiritual level. But one thing we didn't mention last week is this insight from Kelistos Ware, who said, it is only through thanksgiving that I can become myself. Now, as superpowers go, that has to be on the top of the list. I know it sounds strange, but until you invest in thanksgiving, until you give yourself over to gratitude, until you express your deep appre appreciation for all of God's blessings, you will never be your true, true self. You will always be, be a mere shadow of your true self. But here is the good news. With thanksgiving, you can actually become who you were always designed to be. And when we become who we were always meant to be, we awaken to a whole new reality. Thomas Merton said it this way. To be grateful is to recognize the love of God in everything he has given us. And he has given us everything. Gratitude, therefore, takes nothing for granted, but is constantly awakening to new wonder and to the praise of the goodness of God. It is Thanksgiving. Let us invest ourselves in gratitude and in wonder. We're glad you're here. Let us recite our faith together. We believe in one God, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, source of all life and all love. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, fully God, fully human, Savior of the world, the risen King of kings. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the very breath and power of God, sustainer of our life in Christ. We believe in the church, God's family, his people set apart by his grace and purpose, Christ's hands and feet. For we are called to be love and light, to pursue justice and to show mercy, to proclaim the good news of Christ in word and deed and to worship and give thanks to our God, for his love endures forever. Evan's going to come and pray for us now. Evan, please. If you'll bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for this upcoming week, this celebration of Thanksgiving. And while that often has uh, fond memories and great things to look forward to, it can also be a time of anxiousness in dealing with dysfunctional families. And so, Lord, we pray that we would come to you in gratitude despite uh, 
whatever might be going on um, in our heads, in our homes, in our families. Be with us today as we worship you together. Open up our hearts to the grace you've given us that it may overflow and uh, be love to those around us. We pray this all in your son's holy name. Amen. Please stand with us as you're able as we sing.
So before we go to prayer, I thought it would be good for us to have an opportunity for us to share what we are thankful for this year. And I invite you just to stand where you are to speak loudly so that everyone can hear and share one or two things for which you are just so filled with gratitude. Doesn't have to be involved, doesn't have to be a whole narrative. It just needs to come from the situation in China with these house pastors and the, getting their visa to come here. That would be an incredible thing. As well as all the other concerns that are going on in our lives and all the other joys in our lives for which we can give thanks. Our prayer today is from the Book of Common Prayer. It's one of my favorite. Each line is just so rich, carefully crafted, profoundly meaningful, and at least to me, deeply moving. So let's pray it together and just open up for a time for all of us to raise our prayers to God, for we know that he hears us when we lift our hearts to him. Let's pray together. Father God, we are your people gathered here at River's Edge, blessed beyond all expectations. The relationships that have formed here are precious to us and to you. You put us in a family. That's part of your plan. Our salvation is not something that is to be lived out as individuals, but as family, joined together. And I am so thankful for that. Each Friday night at the Edge, I'm reminded again and again and again how blessed we are to have these relationships, where we can have these conversations, where we can speak into each other's lives. And that relationship on Friday night multiplies into conversations on Sunday, and on and on we can go. We are so blessed. We are so thankful. Hear us as we pray this prayer of thanksgiving to you, saying, Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of your people by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray Give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise not only with our lips but in our lives by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. He's going to come and read our text for us today. Today's, today's scriptures reading from Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. <clears throat> it is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, <clears throat> and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. This is God's words for us. This allows us to stand and give praise to him as we hear these words. Stand as you're able.
At this time, we'd like to take up an offering to advance God's kingdom in all directions so that his word would go forth. We invite you to give, to give generously, because God loves a cheerful giver. And God loves to pour out grace upon us generously and wants us to be like him. Let us give with thanksgiving. It's funny how context determines everything. I grew up in churches where we always had in our programs the line special music, but I always understood it to mean somebody else is doing it, I don't have to do anything. That's what makes it special. I don't have to sing. I just sit there and listen. But over the course of time, I've realized that all music is special, and especially the music we have here. I am just so thankful for wonderful music week after week after week after week, and for all those who participate in our music program because it uh, really touches my heart every single week. So thank you, performers and singers and all those who make this very special music. At this time, let's dismiss the kids to their class downstairs. Say the blessing with me. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward us and give us peace. Kids, you are dismissed.
I have three stories about sheep this morning, all true. Stop me if you have heard these before. Five years ago, Sugar the sheep escaped from an Australian farm. The farmer searched and searched, but no luck. However, six months ago, four and a half years after he wandered off, someone spotted Sugar in the most unlikely of places. Sugar was living with a mob of kangaroos outside of Melbourne. That's right, he had taken up residence with kangaroos. Now, unfortunately, catching a sheep is not as easy as it sounds. But after much planning, a team went out and caught the runaway and brought him home. But here's the good news. From everything we can tell, the kangaroos took really good care of sugar. Uh, by the way, do you know what they call a cross between a sheep and a kangaroo? It's called a woolly jumper. <laughs> Story two. Earlier this year, in the middle of the night, seven sheep in Patterson, New Jersey, escaped from a slaughterhouse. So in the morning, instead of ending up dead, they ended up at a local Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> I always knew it was true, if you feel like death, go out for coffee. In any case, the police were called, and after an amateur rodeo, all the sheep were loaded in the back seats of several police cruisers and taken to a nearby animal shelter. The slaughterhouse pardoned the seven of the death row inmates. The animal shelter adopted them, and now the sheep will live out the remaining days on a 600-acre farm. Unfortunately, it is still in New Jersey, <laughs> but you can't have everything. All of that goes to prove the old saying, all's wool that ends wool. A third story. Apparently, in Australia, sheep escape all the time. And if they've been gone for any length of time, they desperately need a haircut. One sheep that the rescuers named Eunice had been missing for over four years. They sheared 44 pounds of wool off Eunice, which is almost enough for a whole other sheep. Oh, do you know what sheep call it when they start dating? They say they are in a relation sheep. Now, 44 pounds is a lot, but the blue ribbon goes to Barack the sheep because he was rescued and they shaved off 70 pounds of wool. They named him Barack because he is the president of the farm's Bible club. What, you didn't know sheep are religious? Of course they are. They are all Baptists. <laughs> Why all this talk about sheep? Because the key verse of our passage this morning tells us something wonderful. It is so wonderful, in fact, that it almost could serve as one of Israel's creeds. Psalm 100, verse 3 says, Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And there it is. We are sheep. Now that can be good news, or bad news. It could be bad news because, as we just saw, sheep are pretty stupid. Why else would they run away and start cohabitating with kangaroos? But it's also good news because in the Bible, good shepherds love their sheep. How do we know that? We'll just flip over to Psalm 23. The first line tells the whole story. In fact, to understand the psalm itself, you have to read every verse in light of that first line. Let me show you what I mean. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, and because of that, I lack nothing. And because he is my shepherd, he makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. And because he is my shepherd, he guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, and you are my shepherd. Your rod and your staff, 
they comfort me. You are my shepherd, and so you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You are my shepherd, and so you anoint my head with oil. You are my shepherd, and so my cup overflows. And because you are my shepherd, I have this sure confidence. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. See, in the Bible, good shepherds love their sheep. And because Psalm 23 is such a pivotal psalm, whenever we read a psalm about Israel's God, we need to import all the qualities of the 23rd Psalm's good shepherd into our understanding of God in our particular psalm. Why? Because Psalm 23 is one of Israel's best pictures of the goodness and grace of God. But... We also need to import the qualities of another shepherd into our understanding of who God is. In John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. All that to say, when the Bible talks about sheep, we know it's either going to show us our foolishness and our sin, all we like sheep have gone astray? Or it is going to show us how much our shepherd, our shepherd God, loves us. Here's the point. In Psalm 100, we see how much our shepherd loves us. But here's the issue. To see that, we have to see ourselves as the sheep of his pasture. Now that sounds simple but it is of utmost importance. See, everything starts with knowing who we are. Klein Snodgrass, in his great book, Who God Says You Are, A Christian Understanding of Identity, writes these words. There is only one question. Who are you? Everything else in life flows from that one question. The identity question is the question. He goes on to the next paragraph. The Bible is about identity. It explains God's identity or Christ's identity, but such explanations never has the purpose of giving us abstract knowledge about God. The identity of God or Christ is explained to show what humans created in God's image are to be. John Calvin put it this way, without knowledge of self, there is no knowledge of God. Without knowledge of God, there is no knowledge of self. In other words, you cannot know yourself without knowing the one in whose image you were created. Now, we should just read that two or three more times and then ponder it for the rest of the service because it is that important. We won't do that, but we should. And yet, there is a problem. We don't and can't and don't want to know ourselves. Goethe said it this way, I do not know myself, and God forbid that I should. Know yourself? If I knew myself, I would run away. And all God's people said, amen, I understand that. G.K. Testerton also agreed. He wrote, one may understand the cosmos, but never the ego. The self is more distant than any star. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, but thou shalt not know thyself. We are all under the same mental calamity. We have forgotten our names. We have all forgotten what we really are. And that is why the Bible spends so much time reminding us who we are. But it is more than that, knowing who we are, knowing that we are not self-made, knowing that we are not self-reliant, knowing that we are not self-righteous. All that has to happen before we can develop a heart of gratitude. And there it is. Identity and gratitude are deeply intertwined. And you can see that in our text this morning. 
Reading again from Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pastor. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Psalm 100 is like a smorgasbord of biblical truth. Plus, everything in it can be found somewhere else. Here's what I mean. The psalm starts off, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Well, we find that expression all over the place. But nothing tops Isaiah 49 for its emotional intensity. In that chapter, God is speaking to his people who are wasting away in exile. So God comes to them with a promise. The day is approaching when the servant of the Lord will come, the Messiah will come and bring healing and strength to his people and restore them fully. But the people don't believe it. They feel God has forsaken them. But God reminds them who they are. Here's the passage from Isaiah 49. The first words should sound familiar. Shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth. Burst into song, you mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. And God responds, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Why will God do this? Because these people living in exile are his people. And as a result of God's redemption, God coming to restore his people and return them to their homeland, the people will shout for joy and give grateful praise. God is so good. Psalm 100 goes on, worship the Lord with gladness. There are echoes there of when Moses went to Pharaoh and, say, and said, let my people go so that they may worship the Lord their God. See, from the very beginning, this has been Israel's call to worship the Lord their God. And that's why we constantly hear various calls to worship scattered throughout the whole Old Testament. None better than Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Why should they worship God? Because they are his people. And as a result, they give themselves to glorify and worship their God and King. The next line in Psalm 100 says, come before him with joyful songs. It's not enough just to worship the Lord with gladness. We are to sing joyfully to him. And in case you aren't aware, joy is a really big deal in the Bible. It's what the angels announced to the shepherds. It's what Jesus promised to give to the disciples. It was what the women experienced at the empty tomb. It was what the Philippian jailer experienced when he came to faith. It was the emotion Paul continually urges us to have. It was one of the chief fruits of the Spirit. And it was at the very heart of Israel's worship. We see that all over the place. Psalm 95 is one of my favorites, so that's the one I'm going to read. Psalm 95 says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Why all this emphasis on joy? Because as C.S. Lewis said, joy is the serious business of heaven. 
But why would Israel come before God with joyful songs? Because they are his people and they delight in him and because God has been so good to them. Because God delights in his people. And that brings us to verse 3. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Here is the heart of grateful praise. Because here in one verse is our deep identity. We are God's people, the sheep of his pasture. And he loves us. The Bible constantly urges us to know certain things. In Deuteronomy 4.35, Moses says, You were shown these things so that you may know that the Lord is God. Besides him, there is no other. In 1 Kings 8, Solomon prays that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is no other. The psalmist cries out, I know that the Lord is great, that our God is greater than all gods. But when it comes to true knowledge, you can't beat Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Why should Israel seek to know God? Because when they know God, they discover who they truly are, that they are his people, the sheep of his pasture. The last two verses of Psalm 100 call us to give thanks. There we read, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Here's what I think. The writer of the Psalms knew how to write. In verses 1 through 2, we encounter three imperatives. Shout for joy, worship, and come. And now these three are put in parallel with another set of three in verse 4. Enter, give thanks, and praise. All in all, we are invited to enter into God's presence with joy and gratitude and worship, for we are his people, the sheep of his pasture, and he loves us. What a great song. Last week, Joe labeled my sermon as one of my happy sermons. It was the kiss of death. <laughs> now, there's nothing wrong with a happy sermon every now and then, one that ruffles no feathers and doesn't make people think too hard. I get that. But I also feel that my calling as a pastor is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And so I began to worry halfway through this sermon that this was another happy sermon and that I was falling into a rut, a happy rut, but a rut nevertheless. What was it that James Bond said, once is happenstance, twice is coincidence, three times is enemy action? Yes, one happy sermon is fine, but we are close to enemy action here. And so let me ask you, what can Psalm 100 do for you so that you really begin to think about this and this changes the whole tenure of the sermon from happy sermon to probing sermon? What can Psalm 100 do for you? Here's my takeaway. Psalm 100 is given to us to remind us who we are. And that is necessary because we often forget that very important truth. Forget Henry Cavill, travel, Cable, travel, Cavill, Cavill. Forget Henry Cavill, Nicholas Cage, he's a joke. Christopher Reeve, not even close. The only actor who played Superman well was George Reeves in the 1950s Adventures of Superman series. And the best episode from that series was Panic in the Sky. A giant asteroid is headed to Earth. If it hits us, everyone and everything dies. This is a job for Superman. 
So Superman goes and crashes into the asteroid. Part of it disintegrates, but a huge part continues its deadly trek to Earth. This looks like a job for Superman. But when Superman crashed into the asteroid the first time, the asteroid also crashed into him. As a result of a particularly nasty bump on the head, Superman has amnesia. He floats down to Earth, but he has no idea who he is or even who Clark Kent is. And so he's wandering around and someone tells him, someone recognizes him that he's Clark Kent, reporter for the Daily Planet. And so he goes to Metropolis and finds Clark's apartment to begin to look for answers. The problem is, Earth needs Superman to fly up and bust the remaining asteroid. But Superman doesn't even have a clue that he can fly or that he can bust up an asteroid in his bare hands. He has no idea he is in any way super. Thankfully, as un-Superman is roaming around Clark's apartment, he discovers his extra Superman costume and begins to put the pieces together that he must be Superman. But he doesn't know how to be super. Maybe the suit has secret powers. Maybe he has to say some magic word. Maybe he has to, oh, in frustration, Superman slams his fist down on the coffee table. And oh my gosh, the coffee table shatters. And that's all it takes. Clark remembers he is Superman. And just like that, he flies up, up, and away, and destroys the asteroid and saves the Earth. He even beats office back to the office to type up the story for the evening edition. Now that is a great Superman episode. Throughout this series, I've been saying that gratitude is a superpower. It enables us to find happiness, contentment, and to see good in every circumstance. More than that, it produces all sorts of incredible spiritual fruit, things like humility, generosity, worship, and peace. Never forget it. Gratitude is a superpower. But the power of gratitude can only be turned on when we remember who we are. When we remember that the Lord is God, that we are made in his image, that we are his, that we are the sheep of his pasture, the objects of God's love and grace, and that we are called to worship our Lord, the King. Here's the bad news. If we forget any of that, if we forget who we are and whose we are, then we will be lost. And gratitude will always be far from us. And its benefits will remain lost to us forever. We will have this incredible superpower within us, a superpower that will change everything, but we will not have any sense on how we can avail ourselves of it. That's why God gave us Psalm 100, to enable us to remember who we are so that we can be filled with gratitude, so that we can enter into his presence with thanksgiving, and so that we can rejoice in Christ our shepherd and worship him. Psalm 100 tells us that we are the sheep of his pasture. John 10 tells us that our shepherd has laid down his life for us. Not only that, but we have been given every spiritual blessing in Christ because we have been incorporated into Christ. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. You are new creation people. That is our true identity. And you have been incorporated into Christ, the Good Shepherd. Clyde Snodgrass writes, people often focus on salvation as a central concern of Christianity. Salvation is obviously important, 
But I am convinced that in focusing on salvation, we have often missed the more foundational focus on identity. Everything flows from identity. In fact, rightly understood, salvation is all about identity. For salvation belongs to those who, through God's Spirit, have been made one with Christ and are taking their identity from him. That is what it means to live by faith. See, faith transforms identity, or else it is not faith. We will not know who we are until we know the God who created us and seeks a relationship with us. Today, you can remember you have superpowers. And all you have to do is to allow these five verses to shape your identity and start to live them out by faith. All you have to do is to embrace this psalm and remember who you are, because remembering who you are will enable you to fly. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his grates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's pray. Father God, we are a forgetful people. All we, like sheep, have turned to our own way. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We forget who we are. We forget who you are. Worse, we believe in our heart of hearts that we ought to occupy the role of God in our lives and that you ought to be a constant servant of blessings. This is at the heart of sin. And so we ask you to do a work of grace where you come in and transform us from the inside out, that you would mark us so that we would always remember who we are and whose we are, that we would give ourselves over to gratitude, and that we would give ourselves over to worship. For in this is the path to freedom. Oh God, work in us and make us thankful. Work in us and make us people who delight in you. Work in us so that we would truly worship you. For you are so good to us so faithful, so true, so loving. Produce the fruit of your spirit in us so that we would be filled with joy in these things. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. We know who we are. We're a people made for praise. Stand with us as we sing.
this Thanksgiving, may you all remember you have superpowers. May you fly with gratitude and worship our Savior and King. The blessing of God. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. God bless you all. Have a great week and a spectacular Thanksgiving. See you next week. God bless you all.